Hey Midtown family, as many of you know, we are in the process of moving into our next church home at 924 East Main Street in Lexington. We are excited to announce that we are in the home stretch of the remodeling process and Lord willing, it won't be too much longer until the building is ready for use. As we're getting ready for our move, there are three things that we've really been trying to put our energy towards. First, obviously, finishing the building, getting everything set for our move in. Second, creating touch points for our church family while we wait for it to get done. And third, preparing ourselves mentally and spiritually for the move ahead. A few of those objectives are actually coming together in some events that we have planned for the days and weeks ahead. First, this afternoon, October 25th, from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m., we're throwing a trunk or treat at the new building. This is a simple touch point just for us to see church family that we haven't seen in a while and check out all the new progress on the facility. Of course, we'll be keeping in mind all necessary COVID precautions, including giving your life group a scheduled time slot to drop by. If you don't know your time, simply ask your life group leader, or if you aren't in a life group, email Hannah Disbro and she will get you all squared away. So come on out, put on your Halloween costumes, come grab some candy, and let's see what's new at 924 East Main. Secondly, on the morning of October 31st from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., we'll be hosting a work day at the new building. This is yet another chance to be together with church family while also giving us the opportunity to invest some sweat equity into our next home. We'll be working on some exterior beautification projects and all skill levels are welcome regardless of your expertise. In fact, bring out the whole family. It's going to be family fun for everyone. As an added bonus, lunch will be provided for everyone who lends a hand. All you need to do is let us know that you're coming. You can swing over to the event page on our website and fill out the RSVP form to let us know that you'll be there. We are incredibly excited for what lies ahead. And while construction isn't quite yet done, be on the lookout over the next several weeks for more information regarding our plans and timelines for when we'll finally be able to regather again. Hey Midtown fam. We're the McKeevers, and we're from Midtown Downtown. Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, and chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to the Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which, of, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? This, this is, is the, the word, word of, of the Lord. Lord. Good morning. I'm Brandon, one of the pastors at our Lexington Church. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Here we're going to find Jesus' most famous teaching about prayer, often called the Lord's Prayer. And it would be hard to overstate the importance of prayer, seeing as how it's the means through which we humans interact with God. It's essential that we know why and how we should pray. It's also one of those subjects that needs a bit of definition because out of 10 people, you might have 10 different ideas of what prayer is and what your experience with it has been. So as we've been doing throughout the series, I'd like to start by considering what ideas Jesus' original audience 
would have had as they listened to his teaching. So just to reset our context here, we have a crowd of first century citizens of the Middle East gathered around Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount. Their culture was a pre-modern society that would feel like an alien world compared to ours. It was an agrarian society where crops and animals were an important part of survival. Rain or lack thereof could produce serious issues of food insecurity. And most all people worked with their hands, jobs like fisherman and blacksmith and tent maker and shopkeeper and innkeeper and farmer and the like. They lived at a very militarized and tribal time of history. So democracy, at least as we know it, was not even a twinkle in a great, great, great grandchild's eye at this point. The idea of common people having an actual voice, much less a vote, and their government was laughable. Kings with unlimited power sat atop most nations and made happen whatever they wanted to happen. They were also a patriarchal society, and one thing that meant was that fathers were very revered and respected. Fathers weren't known as clueless buffoons, like many of our sitcoms portray them today, but as towering figures who protected their family in a dangerous world and provided for their family's needs in a harsh environment. Men and fathers in particular were often the means through which provision and protection came. And society, generally speaking, was not cynical, if not downright antagonistic toward its men and its fathers. So that's some of the cultural backdrop. So now let's think about the religious setting. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, notes that Jesus is talking to his disciples and a crowd. No matter what the particular makeup of that crowd was, they would have been familiar with the two groups mentioned throughout the New Testament, which are Jews and Gentiles or pagans. Jews were followers of the Old Testament, and at this time in history, that truly meant something. Nowadays, if someone says they are Jewish, it, it could mean an awful lot, or it could summarize their family background. The same way that if someone in the South says they're a Christian, uh, that doesn't necessarily tell me a whole lot, and it doesn't remotely mean they are actually what the Bible says as a Christian. So the Jewish people of this time had a deep reverence for Yahweh, the God of Israel who continually revealed himself through the Old Testament. They knew of the many rituals and sacrifices necessary to atone for sins. They were accustomed to picking out spotless animals to symbolically cover their many spots. They knew the smell of burning carcasses through sacrifices. And all of that happened far outside of the inner layers of the temple where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies behind veils no normal mortal dared to cross. So the whole feeling around approaching God was quite serious. And they had a pre-existing reverence for Yahweh that would be hard for us to fathom. Their thoughts about prayer tended to reflect all of that. So their prayers tended to be more on the formal, rote, repetitive side. Orthodox Jewish prayer, at times referred to as the 18 benedictions, uh, were impressive but long, and they had to be recited more than once daily by the truly devout. The Gentiles, on the other hand, thought about prayer much differently because they thought of God or the gods much differently. We'll get there in a second, but just know that what Jesus is going to do today is blow both of their minds and invite them into something incredible. So let's pick up in Matthew 6, starting in verse 5. As Jesus talking, he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. So we'll pause there because he's speaking to the Jewish religious crowd here. And like Bailey mentioned last week, Jesus looked at some of the professional religious types, the Pharisees and experts of the law, and he came up with a piercing term for them. He said, look at them. They are just actors. They are performing. They're putting on a show. He continues, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So Jesus says their motive in prayer is actually to gain standing in front of others. They don't have God in mind as they pray. They have people in mind. Jesus simply says that they already have what they are after. 
For simplicity's sake, we'll actually skip verse 6 for a second and come right back to it. We'll go to verse 7 now. He says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So the Gentiles had gods and goddesses of all kinds and pagan rituals to appease them. And the general belief was that the gods or goddesses were busy and distracted. They were not concerned with mere mortals. So if you needed their help, you had to act out to get it. This could range from wordy, repetitive, dramatic prayers to public displays of a dire need, like putting on a show through screaming at the heavens or tearing your clothes or something like that. But the belief was that if you wanted their help, you had to first prove your sincerity and your worthiness. And Jesus says, they are wrong too. They only think a sovereign being will hear them if they act crazy to get attention. But Jesus says God actually is not distracted or busy. He's already paying attention. In fact, he even knows what you need before you even ask him. You don't have to flag him down because like a father, he's already there beside you. Let's go back to verse six. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Depending on your translation, there's some variance on what is meant by go to your room. When I was growing up, I always read where it said, go in your closet. And I always thought that was a bit odd. Like, why would I go in my closet to pray? We have a baby that still sleeps in our closet now, so how would that even work, Jesus? But scholar Frederick Dale Bruner makes an interesting point here because in this culture, privacy was far more difficult to come by than it is for us. They lived in more close-knit villages and there was not always the most dense construction. And especially for poor Palestinian families, it was likely that there was only one room in their house that had a lock on it. And that was their supply closet. The supply closet was kind of like a combination of a pantry and a storage room. So in one way, this is the least sanctified room in the house. It was used to store feed and tools and small animals and other supplies that you didn't want to be stolen. But unlike other areas, you could close the door to this room and lock it and find some privacy. It was somewhere you could truly be yourself before God with everything else stripped away. So zooming way out, Jesus says, hey, see those guys over there in the robes praying elaborate prayers in front of others so people will think they're super righteous? Don't be like them. And those people over there acting a fool because they think they have to wear out the goddess of rain to bless them with crops? Don't be like them either. Instead, go home to your supply room. Knock the animal feed out of the way. Lock the door and quiet yourself before God. Strip away all of your pretense and humbly, genuinely bring your true self to God as your father. The scholar also believes there would have been a connection for the Jewish listeners here between the closet and the Holy of Holies at the temple, as if this is a foreshadowing of Jesus teaching that through his atoning work on our behalf in the future, the Holy of Holies in the temple, the most special meeting place between God and humanity, would actually be your closet. So according to Jesus, the ability to draw near to God's radiant glory in your very own supply room of all places is a reward too great to fathom. You will find life and peace and power there when you get everything else out of the way and encounter God's presence in the closet. And starting in verse nine, he's gonna give his hearers a model for how to approach God rightly in prayer in said closet. Pick it up in verse nine. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We'll cover verses 14 and 15 in the midweek podcast, but, but stopping here, what we have is the most famous Christian prayer. Jesus says, this is how we appropriately come to God in prayer. And it tells us an awful lot about the God we are told to pray to. If I were to summarize the picture of God painted here, it would be this, that God is a supremely powerful king who loves us like a father. A supremely powerful king who loves us like a father. The picture here is that God is hallowed or revered because of his supreme power. As one of the Psalms says, God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. His kingdom is much bigger than Israel or Rome or Great Britain or any other kingdom. He's king of the realms we can't see or even perceive. God knows whether aliens exist, and if they do, he's king of them too. And because he is king, we are to revere his name. We are to ask his kingdom and rule and reign to come invade earth and fix everything sin has broken here. Because he is king, we are to ask him for forgiveness for our sins of rebellion against his rule and his authority. But he's not just king. He is a father king. Jesus' teaching about God being our father in the Sermon on the Mount likely would have struck his hearers. The king part they got, they knew kings. But the idea that God would be our father to the Gentiles, that would have sounded like lunacy. They thought the gods and goddesses were basically selfish teenagers in the sky. You had to flag down for help. To the Jews, this would have been a twist as well because the word father was used at times in the Old Testament to describe God, but not usually in individual terms, encouraging us to approach God as a father. But because he's father, according to Jesus, we can come straight to him with no preparation, no nervousness, just like my kids come to me. And when we come before him, he already knows what we need because he loves us and he's paying close attention to our lives. Because he's our father, we ask him for provision, for food. It literally says, ask God for daily bread. And there were likely some people listening to Jesus whose bread for tomorrow was not yet secured. So this was quite a real request. Because he's father, we pray to him to protect us from evil like any good father is called to do for his kids. To be on the lookout for things and people that would hurt them. And we ask him to keep us away from temptation, to wisely point us away from troublesome areas like any good father of a teenager does. So just to recap, Jesus says, those people over there are all wrong about prayer and those people over there are too. And then he paints this picture that God is like the biggest and best king ever, that he runs the stuff that the people who run stuff are made of. But he's not like politicians here because he's inherently good and pure and well-intentioned. And not only that, but he's also chosen to feel about you the way the best of fathers feel about their own kids. This cosmic king wants you to call him father and approach him like you would if you desperately loved and trusted your own dad. So just get by yourself where you can be honest and simply come to him, ask him for what you need. Don't feel pressure to go on and on or perform for him because none of that is necessary. He already knows what you need anyway. And now if, if all of this is actually true, this is an absolutely stunning reality that Jesus invites us into. So for us as Christians, it begs a question, are you operating like all of this is true? Notice I didn't ask if you know that this is true. Many of us cognitively understand some of this. I'm asking if you pray like all of that is true. And if you would say you are not praying as if all of that is true, that's something we need to diagnose. And I think what we've already covered actually gives us some helpful categories to diagnose why. So here are three reasons we don't pray like Jesus taught. 
Number one is you don't truly think God is a supreme king. And this one is so simple to prove, it's actually kind of silly. So if the year 2020 has taught us anything, it's that anything can happen, right? I mean, at this point, the alien invasion has to be the next chapter of the movie we're living in. So in the spirit of this year, imagine that America turns into a monarchy with a capital M. We no longer have a constitutional republic, but we have a king who calls literally every shot. He has power to make anything happen. And here's the kicker. He's a good king. He is a foundationally benevolent person with unprecedented power. And let's say that by some crazy circumstance, you of all people have a pre-existing relationship with the king of America. So you have a freestanding appointment available with him every day at 12 p.m. He's got you on his calendar. He'll turn down Putin or Queen Elizabeth for you. And you can ask him about anything and for anything. He's infinitely wise, so it doesn't mean he'll grant every single wish, but he wants to hear them all. In that pretend scenario, let me just ask you, are you gonna make the meeting tomorrow? Of course you are. Are you ever going to miss that meeting? Would you ever skip it to watch The Bachelor? Would you ever be like, you know, I'm a little tired today, King of America. You just do you. Of course you wouldn't. Of course you'd be there every day with your list because he can make things happen that you could never, ever make happen. Try as you might. So what do your current prayer habits reveal about how you perceive God's power? If someone was able to listen to every prayer you prayed silently or out loud for the past month, what would they think about the God you prayed to? Would they think, man, this God must be able to do anything? Or would they think, why would you even pray to this God? He doesn't seem very powerful. If you don't think God is the supreme ruler of the heavens and whatever is beyond them, then you won't find yourself bothering him. Likewise, if you believe yourself to be quite secure, thank you very much, financially and otherwise, maybe you won't see your need for a king because you fancy yourself doing a pretty good job on your own. If you mistakenly believe that you run stuff, you'll find little use for a heavenly ruler who does until one day when the bottom drops out of your life and suddenly you do. That's reason number one. Reason number two, you don't believe God is a trustworthy father. There are not many words that are more meaningful and powerful and emotionally freighted than the word father. And there are as many different reactions to that word as there are types of fathers in the world. And depending on what kind of father you had, your response to that may fall somewhere between no way, this is amazing, all the way to no thanks. So it's an intriguing choice God makes to reveal himself as father. And it appears that God is not afraid of being overshadowed by bad earthly dads but is so confident in his eternal goodness and protection that no other term will help us better understand. Deep down, we all know there's just something about a father. When you look at all kinds of issues we have as humans, you can draw a straight line to the physical and emotional presence or absence of a father. Statisticians have found concrete connections between fatherlessness and poverty and crime. While on the other side, you can often draw a straight line from a warm and engaging father to many positive traits like self-confidence and leadership. One pastor said that he could cut his pastoral counseling time with someone in half simply by starting with the question, so tell me about your dad. 
That is just incredibly telling. And we are complex beings, and this is not always one-to-one, but wise outside observers can often find many insightful connections between the type of father you had and the issues you have today. So if you're a Christian who isn't operating like Jesus describes in your prayers to God, it very well could be because you simply don't believe it's true. Maybe in your experience, father means absent or harmful or detached or uncaring or selfish. Maybe it gives you the picture of someone who doesn't even have the desire or capability to meet your needs. So you've grown accustomed to not asking for things from a father for a very long time. We find out in chapter seven that Jesus is confident that the heavenly father is able to overshadow any experience you've had. Here's what he says, starting in verse seven. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So let's think about how this would have landed for Jesus' original audience. They were a culture that in many ways were defined by their fathers, by their ancestors. They took enormous pride in being children of Abraham, being descendants of Moses or David. They had enormous affection and warmth toward these towering patriarchs, even through their many missteps. And Jesus says, even the best earthly fathers, the the ones men should aspire to live up to, even they are evil. They are corrupt in heart. They fall and make mistakes. And if even they know how to give good gifts to their children, How much more your Father in heaven? How much more will he give good things to those who ask him? So think about the best father figure you've ever had in your life. Maybe it is your dad, or maybe it's your grandfather, or an uncle, or a teacher, or just a man who stood in a gap for you, who looked out for you, a man who would make you smile if he walked into the room, a man who you would call if you had a genuine problem. Think of the gratitude and joy you feel toward him and what his actions have proven he feels toward you. How much more, how much more must this heavenly father Jesus speaks of feel for you? How much more protective must this heavenly father be over you? to keep you from wrecking your life in rebellion and sin? How much more does this heavenly father want you to flourish and come alive into the mature follower of Jesus he designed you to be? How much more? The truth is, however wonderful that father figure has been in your life, what Jesus says is he doesn't compare to this father. None of us can or do. This father in heaven means to forgive every fiber of your rebellion against him, heal every wound on your soul, and shore up everything that is lacking with a love that cannot come from earth. We cannot fathom how much more he loves us than even the best of fathers we know. Reason number three, you don't have a closet. You don't have a closet. Jesus seems to teach here that in order to have this kind of vibrant and fruitful prayer life with the Father King of the universe, you're going to need some time and a place to focus on praying to him. We probably have in general different problems accomplishing this than the original hearers. And odds are you could find a space to get by yourself and quiet before God that isn't the supply room with animal food in it. 
So you may not be wondering, where could I actually be by myself like they may have? Instead, you're probably wondering, when would I do that? And on an off day, you could be tempted with some chronological snobbery toward the people of this time. You might think, well, of course they had time for this. I mean, they didn't even have electricity. What was they to do after the sun went down, like stare at a candle? That's not how life works now, though, right? So when talking about prayer, I often hear people say that they pray as they go, meaning that they try to pray on their drive to work or at the gym or while they're doing some other task. And please hear me say that we wholeheartedly affirm all of that. That is something we'd like to increase in your life, not decrease. But if that is you, I would argue that Jesus in these verses calls you into something far more rewarding. What he teaches here is that there is no replacement for protected, single-minded, solitary time alone with God your Father in prayer. There's a power and a reward there that cannot be found anywhere else. And these times don't have to be long or extended, as Jesus says. Reformer Martin Luther uh, taught a sermon on this text about, um, and he said, many of our prayers, like the one Jesus prayed here, should be brief, frequent, and intense. Brief, frequent, and intense. Brief because we're not trying to impress God or anyone else. Frequent because we know we need someone who can do all of the things we can't. And intense because we're bringing our true selves and our true needs before the Father King and trusting that regardless of the outcome, He cares. He's for our good and He's working for our good. So our genuine prayers to God can be brief, frequent, and intense, but they need to happen. You need some time set aside that has only one purpose, where you come before your Father King, honestly and openly, open your heart and ask for what you need. We have different responsibilities in life, but but time is a resource where we all get the exact same amount. We may have varying amounts of disposable time, but every single one of us, no matter if you are a college student or an exhausted parent with three young kids, have some time that you have control over. We have moments where we can get alone in whatever the closet may be for you and get quiet and bring the full reality of our day and our needs to God. And when you come to see how rewarding it is, any thoughts that you don't have time to draw near to God like this start to feel silly. Because these closet meetings with a father king start to feel like water for you, like oxygen. They become a holy space where all of the swirling and chaos of life calms down and you find clarity. Personally, my closet is outside at night looking at the stars, or sometimes sitting at my desk with a journal in hand. And I know exactly the reward Jesus speaks of in this passage because when I go outside on a clear night, it's like I can feel all of the jumbled mess of my waking thoughts where my tunnel vision just seems to stop here a foot above my head and I look up at the stars and it's like I'm immediately going, oh. And as I quiet myself before God, I start to get a clarity that I don't find anywhere else, a peace I don't find anywhere else. If I pray out loud or write prayers in my journal, I find it helps my focus tremendously. And whatever your situation is, you need to determine what your closet will be. You need a place and a time that you will designate for that purpose. Otherwise, it won't happen. And if we have any hope of following Jesus and walking in maturity and relating to the Father as Jesus did, then getting alone before God in prayer is an absolute necessity. It's something we all need to grow in, and we have so much working against us to keep us from this incredible invitation. And for some of us, to that list of things working against us, I would add this year. Like many of you out there, this has been a tough year for me. Certainly not the hardest year of my life, but without a doubt, the hardest ministry year of my life. And I know many of you have faced all kinds of challenges and hardships in this year that that none of us will forget. I mean, think about it. If someone in the future came up to me and they were like, hey, what happened in 2013? I'd be like, 
Uh, I don't know. But if they were to ask, hey, what happened in 2020? I would say, sit down, child. (laughs) Sit down. I've learned a lot this year that's been difficult. In March, I learned that I can't ensure our church can gather on a Sunday. And that was just the first domino. I've also learned that I can't keep horrible things from happening to people I love. I can't keep dear friendships from dissolving in tragic chaos. I can't ensure that people I care for deeply won't leave our church. I can't make people I've poured blood and sweat and tears into not forsake Jesus and walk confidently into sin. There are so many outcomes, positive and negative, that I am completely unable to produce or prevent. I desperately need access to someone who can. I've learned that I can't afford to miss my appointment with the king. I've also learned that sometimes when facing pain and disappointment, I don't choose to access the father king that's freely made himself available to me. But instead, I just choose to grow numb to the pain or the disappointment. Earlier this summer, I sensed God's spirit just pressing on me that I was numbing my pain and requests instead of taking them to God. And it almost felt like he pointed at me and he said, you know, watching The Office is a fine way to decompress, but it won't remotely fix the grief and disappointment swirling inside of you. So one night I walked out to my backyard and I laid down on our trampoline and looked at the stars. And then I just proceeded to tell God every single thing I could think of that I was sad about the big things all the way to the smaller things. And I may have cried a lot, but I simply came to God as a child with my many, many needs and reminded myself that he is a father king. I should talk to about all of those needs and that he wants to hear about them all. And just let me tell you, Jesus is not a liar, because it was very rewarding indeed, far more rewarding than anything else I could have spent that time doing. This is what's available to me every day because of Christ. That's what's available to you every day if you are a Christian covered by the blood of Christ. God the Father has opened up his supreme power and eternal love and warm presence to you and I. And we are invited to meet him in whatever our closet may be and bring him all of our needs and requests. He is the king of galaxies who loves us so much he sacrificed his son for us so we could draw near to the throne of grace as his kids. Let's not be foolish enough to forsake that mind-bending privilege and deny all of the rewards that come with it. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for the unbelievable privilege we see in this passage. That you invite us to draw near to you. That you invite us to approach you as a father king a king who can do something about all of the needs we have and a father who uh, cares to, who loves us more deeply than we could ever imagine. And Father, I know that we all need help with this. So please help us by the power of your spirit to learn to actually operate like this is true and to actually pray as if you are a supremely powerful king who loves us like a father. Teach us the unbelievable grace and reward found here. And help us to walk in this as your kids. We need all of your help, and we thank you for Jesus that makes all of this possible. We love you. Amen.